welcome to Auntie's Bloomers, a sort of crafty rummage around the BBC's drawers. <laughs> Gather together a comedy of errors, many never seen before on British television. This is the show that keeps in all the cock-ups and cuts out all the best bits. <laughs> now, those of you who remember Crossroads will get the general idea. <laughs> but before we embark on this mass destruction of professional reputations, there's something we desperately need to explain. Throughout the show, you'll hear quite a lot of this. <laughs> now, when you hear <laughs> all it means is that a mild expletive has slipped from the lips <laughs> of a frustrated television performer. <laughs> And you just have to use your imagination. Probably covering up something like Heavens to Betsy. <laughs> Fiddle dee. Now you'll hear a lot of high sounding talk from people in this business about how difficult it all is. Don't believe it. Television is as easy as falling off a log. The 82nd Airborne Division of the American Army are among the toughest troops in the world held at what is known as instant readiness. <laughs> not one week's notice, not one day's notice, not one hour's notice to go into action, but instant notice. The American army has a long history of arriving in just in time to save the day, and it goes right back to the days of the earliest settlers, when traditionally the cavalry would gallop over the <laughs> to save the settlers. And the American soldier has always been an integrated part of the American way of life. <laughs> Well, you've got one here. I gather that you've practically had to rear yourself. Well, I can't claim to have reared it myself, but Marina, the girl who looks after all our llamas, and my wife, started off by feeding Caesar eight times a day. In fact, Caesar's, Caesar's mother had sadly died before he was born. Uh, she had complications with the birth. Caesar <coughs> was subsequently... <laughs> 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 Got any? <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what then. Right. I tell you what. Tell you what. I won't go anywhere. I'll, I'll ignore the pin. Okay. Do you think? Uh, and I'll just sort of aim where I think. All right then. They go, but in the wrong direction. <laughs> and I say it by the tree, except the referee. <laughs> the from down through. This is the one that really caused the problems, and it's caused off for him too. Oh, he seemed to lose all confidence. He just threw that off. He caught his thigh in the handlebars, and you see him holding himself. Oh dear! And this is John's ambulance man uh, trying to get there in a hurry. Well, he probably needs some treatment in a minute. <laughs> Nick Newton, the promoter. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is... Uh, one shouldn't laugh. The call out uh, took a nasty knock there, but this is uh, a bit like the Keystone Cops down there. <laughs> no, one shouldn't laugh. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how popular I've become in the BBC canteen ever since the word got around that I was going to be putting this programme together. I've been showered with jammy dodgers and towed in the hole by some of television's most illustrious names, all desperate not to appear on this show. <laughs> well, it should be known that I cannot be bought, not at any price. So Rick Mayle, John Cleese, Chris Tarrant, Jasper Carrot, Sue Lawley and all the rest of you, your sordid attempts at corruption were all in vain. My silence couldn't even be bought by the most persuasive voice on the box. We need six millimetre PLY. I don't know, what's PLY? Ply. Plywood. <laughs> 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 um, eight feet by four feet sheets. 
Okay. Does that sound right? I'm, yes. I'm, I've been given a list, so I, I'm not exactly au fait with uh, some of these technical terms. Nails. on buckets and sponges. Do you have those? Oh, wonderful. We, we need 20 large buckets and sponges. <laughs> Sorry, <I just> snoozed. <laughs> Annika again. We've had Hello, very Hello, bad problems trouble. with our um, mobile phones. <laughs> I should say so. They call it the curse of the corpse. Corpsing or laughing at the wrong moment is as old as entertainment itself. As any schoolboy has ever sat through assembly knows, when a fit of the giggle strikes, there's no known cure. And the more you try to stop yourself, the worse it becomes. Let's bring out our dead and revive the corpses. Ah, Briggs, Louis. Been looking for you two. You don't mind if we don't salute, sir, do you? Call them in They want us to handle something very big. Very, very big. <laughs> this will be the biggest thing I've ever had to handle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like a pee. Did you? It's a relief to everybody. Slightly. <laughs> uh, slightly wrong. It, 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 we take the initial of the piece as well as the initial of the piece. Yes, I see. Well, wait for the next one. <laughs> By the way, I meant to tell you, I got another tortoise. I took it round this afternoon. They don't suspect a thing, so don't you go say anything, all right? Let's just let sleeping dogs lie. I rang her up this morning just after you went out. I told her it was dead. <laughs> I'm sorry! <laughs> There's no way! <laughs> a fondue. It's a molten mixture of cheese and of wine and of kirsch. And you dip bread into it, swoosh it around, and it tastes fantastic. But there's something to remember. You'll be very careful what you drink. Um, if you just drink something that's ice cold, like mineral water, the bread and the cheese form into this great big lump, which has in the past had to be surgically removed. So it's best to drink something with alcohol in it, like beer, or something warm, like tea or coffee. Something very important to remember, unless you want to end up in hospital at the end of your meal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I continue to do the link. This wasn't such a big piece of bread. Mr. Solicitor has gone on a long, long... <laughs> 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 Mr. Solicitor has gone on a long, long journey in his momo, and he won't... <laughs> most difficult drum that you've ever had to do? Uh, I suppose about a five foot diameter one. Five foot in diameter? Yeah. That's, as, that's as tall as me are, maybe? Uh, virtually, yeah. How long did it take to do? About a week, but about a month getting it together. How did you get it down the stairs? Uh, halfway down the stairs and then out through a window. Oh, you actually... That was the only way out, is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 
when we die. How did you get it down the stairs? <laughs> you started. I didn't. Going back to the big bass drum that you made. <laughs> Hang on, I can't it. Going back to the big bass drum. Mm. <laughs> How did you manage to get it down the stairs? <laughs> How did you manage to get it out? such iron self-control. <laughs> Jasper Carrot and Robert Powell there, the undisputed kings of the cops. In the time it took them to make that series, they could have reshot Ben Hur. <laughs> now you'd think, wouldn't you, that the serious, grown-up world of BBC current affairs would be immune to this sort of fourth-form behaviour. You'd imagine that when a journalist joins the news department, he has his sense of humour surgically removed, like tax inspectors and traffic warnings. Not a bit of it. Underneath those hard-bitten, news-hound exteriors, there are funny bones just waiting to be dislocated. Now, you've all seen this next fella looking grave and concerned on your news bulletins, as is fitting. But I don't think you've ever seen him quite like this. Why does your committee favour the minesweeper option when so many people in Jersey think a helicopter would be of... S nearly there. Why is your committee insisting on minesweepers when so many people in Jersey, well, at least two? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, the, 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 there was a question, there was a question, and it, it was something along the lines of, um, you know, why, why, do you, why, why do you want a minesweeper when so many people think that a helicopter would be more useful? Right. Okay, okay, All right. right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. You're, you're, you're... All right. Is it rolling? Fine, okay. <laughs> Still running. <laughs> I calm down a minute. And you might just be able to get the scissors in here. Uh, and I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, good. Why is... We're going to, I mean, honestly, the electricity, we're burning up here. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Do I don't look as though I've just been laughing? Do I? Good. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> he is guarding the door, isn't he? I mean, if anybody were listening to this, it would be nice to burn it. Um, uh, uh, question. <laughs> Yeah, mine's stupid, it's not there. Dave, you, could, you, could you stand? No, no, seriously, if you just stood there. It's just having something over there. I mean, it's all been his fault, aren't we? <laughs> so I'm just having, 
the, uh, the, uh, the question is something along the lines about why is your committee um, so insistent on a mic? <laughs> under the table. <laughs> I never asked that question in the end. Shame on you, Laurie Mayer. But, of course, it's not always the poor journalist's fault. When it comes to cock-ups, it seems everyone wants to lend a hand. The world is full of frustrated performers. Can't wait to get in front of the camera and make their bid for glory. It seems that as soon as a director shouts, Action! A whole hit squad of uninvited extras decide to strike for fame. Both Prime and Trestrail had gone undetected by the system of positive vetting used by the security services to discover whether or not their employees are spies or potential blackmail victims. As a result of the Prime case, the Prime Minister ordered an investigation by the Security Commission. And today it has been revealed that their main recommendation will be the introduction of lie detectors into this country. We could have at least another four long years Quite when, <laughs> quite when. <laughs> quite when. <laughs> Very difficult. Quite when. <laughs> Phil, stand. Excuse me. I hope this is the right number. Right. Hello there, who's that? Duncan. Hello, Duncan. Um, is Louise there? Louise? Yes. Right. No. Right. Does Louise live there? Louise. Louise or Louise. Verity? Is Verity there? Verity. No, Verity. Yeah. No, Verity. How, how about helping me with, with the Louise one? <laughs> Does anyone called Louise live there? No. No. That's good. Wrong number. That's, those are the two words I was looking for. <laughs> Wrong number. Thank you, Duncan. Lovely to talk to you. You were just live on the television. Let's try again. <laughs> I hope it's not Duncan. <laughs> Hello? Hello, is that Louise? Yes. <laughs> Do you don't know a Duncan by any chance, do you? Yeah. <laughs> you know him? Yeah. <laughs> is he thick or something? He's <laughs> a little boy. I think you'll handle him very well. <laughs> <laughs> Dunsmore was said to have pressed cannabis supplied by two of the defendants into the hand of a 22-year-old pop fan who... Oh. Mr. Wayne, the papers here are saying that Soviet troops have been put on the alert. Is that so? I wouldn't put it as much as that. The impression I get is this, that at the moment, Moscow wants to exploit the whole situation uh, to its advantage. The court was told that the drugs, LSD, heroin, amphetamine... Oh. This is like a picket of the circus. Well, well, I'm coming the other way now. <laughs> right. I'm running. Yeah, OK. The court was told that the drugs, heroin, LSD, amphetamines, and... Oh. Dog, no. It's likely that Tootle and Coates Viella will still have a hurdle to jump.
<laughs> You're always the way. Hey, I tried to earn an honest crust and some old biddy wanders into the shop. <laughs> Waste another few feet of perfectly good film. Now, if anyone recognises the old biddy in this next clip, could they please keep her away from our camera crews in future? <laughs> This is what it's like being on the campaign trail with the Prime Minister in 1983. It's as far removed from traditional campaigning as it's possible to imagine. There aren't many voters in sight. What there are are hundreds of members of the media who swarm around the Prime Minister, follow her every move. The idea from the Conservatives' point of view is to get the best possible exposure on the TV news that evening. That man deserves a medal carrying on under threat of a severe handbagging. <laughs> and by the way, BBC News teams, if you think you got away lightly, have a care. I've got a whole section devoted just to you later on in the show. Indeed, we've got a whole corporation to embarrass here and so little time to do it. The BBC has always prided itself on costume drama. Those lavish affairs were no expenses spared to recreate life as it used to be lived. The Beebs costume drama department is like a time capsule where everything is exactly as it was a hundred years ago. Even the wages. <laughs> it's only the eagle-eyed viewer who spots even the slightest slip-up. Watch this. Indeed, you shall not. For you must positively say, in every letter to Mary, I am well. I know you cannot write or speak a falsehood. Sir, you must not, you or your sister, concern yourself on my account. Yet I do. I shall do very well. <laughs> I'm not in the the waiting for us. No doubt you disapprove of me. But I might have what you need. I don't want to waste your time, Mr. Billington. Don't lie to me, Mrs. Southworth. You're thinking, <laughs> why is he standing on my frog? <laughs> The papers you require from my desk. And take only those papers. <laughs> I've lost the key. <laughs> it's gone right down. Never mind about them. I do mind about them. Have they any rights? It's difficult, but I doubt it, since Uncle Henry never left anything in writing. As far as we know. <laughs> I would know, believe me. noticed in these last few clips how the noblest of human endeavors can be thwarted by the actions of supposedly inanimate objects. There's a general law on television that the more money you spend on a set, the more things there are that can go wrong. That's why I'm very confident about this. <laughs> and corrugated cardboard they've given me. Of course, there is talk within the corporation that these very studios are haunted by the BBC's own official ghost. Playful fellow who likes to liven things up a little by rearranging the furniture at the worst possible moment. I've heard stories of a strange, haunted-looking figure walking the corridors of Broadcasting House late at night, making a weird, wailing noise. But enough of Jimmy Savile. Let's, <laughs> let's take a look at the BBC's resident poltergeist in action. 
Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, our overseas sports personality of 1980, Jack Nicholas. <laughs> and flooding is still causing problems in Derbyshire, Leicestershire and the Seven Valley, where thousands of acres are underwater. Sorry about that. One of our fires has exploded. <laughs> I have a feeling that it is moving that way, though I did get the impression this evening from British government sources that they weren't too happy with the sort of suggestions that are being made with regard to the budget. They were saying that it didn't really seem to satisfy the problems that the British have on getting rid of this problem. <laughs> you might think that one of the exhibits was another visitor. He's a life-size model of a businessman. Oh. <laughs> oh and it just shows how fragile these things are. Max Milo's my usual tolerant and easy-going approach to communal living. Silence! <laughs> <laughs> in that pub by the allotment? Everywhere. Nobody knows where he is. He's with that tart. That's where he is. She pursed her lips, flushed her inflatable breasts, flushed her gaudy knickers, and he's followed her to Ireland. Now, that might not be the case, ma'am. You know what Dad's like. He ran off the council car once, didn't he? Just ran off. I'm telling you, Joey, I knew she was here in the city the other day. Oh, there's somebody talking on the phone. <laughs> It's a new romantic book designed by Sarah Bradley, who's 15, from St. Austell in Cornwall. And what I liked about this was the, the flowing lines of the material on the shirt and the trousers, even down to the blood. <laughs> 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 Sarah, <laughs> and around on to patches of mist and fog farming in many inland areas as well. And then on to tomorrow as well, uh, another basically Oh, <laughs> the volcanoes of today are mere feeble Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Ow! Thorough check of salvage material reveals no trace of parts used in manufacture of component 1430. It is virtually certain, therefore, that the instrument was removed before the explosion. Component 1430. <laughs> Well, what do you say about that? dotted about here and there and as the day goes on I think we're going to find these showers will tend to become heavier and more frequent and many of them could well turn out later on in the day to be uh, fairly thundery with some uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Now, all those poor unfortunates could quite reasonably raise their hands and say, Mea non culpa, that's Latin for which Egypt built this set. <laughs> and there's nothing the TV performers like more than having someone else to blame. There's so many people on the average film set, it might seem to an untrained observer that half of them are doing absolutely nothing. It's absolute nonsense. It's two-thirds for doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and the rest are making the tea. But the one man who very rarely gets the blame is the sound man. He's the man who waves one of these around. <laughs> a marvellous thing, isn't it? They breed them in captivity up at Elf Street. <laughs> this one smells like the wrath of God and is called Mike. <laughs> I, I, once, uh, I once asked one of the BBC's most senior sound engineers why it was that his microphones were all covered in fur. And he said, Pardon? <laughs> Life isn't easy for the man with the hamster on a stick. <laughs> Sometimes, just one little sound can make all the difference. Let me leave your retainer as I came. Unescorted, an English gentleman of not much wealth or position or rank. <laughs> we've run a good course, the three of us. Thanks to you, we've defeated traitors and set the king firm on his throne. <laughs> the finest Elfberg of them all, Englishman. Goodbye, old friend. <laughs> Let's say au revoir. the confusion over dates when you've got the <laughs> <laughs> what about the confusion over dates when you've got the changeover system <laughs> <laughs> shut up you stupid cockerel <laughs> what about the possibility of confusion over the changeover period Of course, for years, performers have been blaming their four-legged co-stars for making a hash of things. That's why they call them scapegoats, I suppose. <laughs> Ever since David Attenborough first donned a safari suit and stood up to his welly tops and a pile of bat droppings, <laughs> television has had a fascination with the animal kingdom. You can understand it, of course. Animals don't have agents. <laughs> they don't demand a five-star dressing room with ensuite jacuzzi. <laughs> Can't get one of them around here. And you really can get them to work for peanuts. <laughs> you always know where you stand when you're working with animals. If you've got any sense, you stand as far away as possible. for winning the World Championship might well be paltry, John's still hoping that this cock of the North can pull it off. <laughs> if the Red Wings Horse Sanctuary does reach its target of £116,000, it's going to be able to chase a lot more horses. <laughs> Oh, I couldn't finish it, sorry. It passed me on the head. Right, this is the one. <laughs> if the Red Wings Horse Sanctuary doesn't... If the Red Wings Horse Sanctuary does reach its target of £116,000, 
Then it'll be able to say a lot more horses, like Bandit here, in the knacker's yard. He's had a stroke. Reckoned it was something like that. Is there all you can do, James? He's not in pain. He's quite comfortable. <laughs> well, you found like that one time. <laughs> But if you get close to a baby badger, don't get too close. Oh! <laughs> they do bite as well. Yes, I have uh, noticed. <laughs> the most pampered porker in Britain. He lives in absolute luxury, as you can see. But there's one very important thing missing from his life. Find out what that is. Oh, get off! <laughs> go about this show jumping? Well, to do the show jumping, he, uh, I just run in front of the jumps and he just follows me over them all. You can blame the scenery, you can blame the crew, you can blame the poor dumb animals. But comes a time when the buck stops right here in the huge echoing void known laughably as the performer's brain. <laughs> it's a rat, pigeon. That's a rat. No, 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 it's hamster. It's a rat, of course it's a rat. You have rats in Spain, don't you? Or did Franco have them all shot? <laughs> it's a pigeon. It's a rat. It's not a pigeon, it's a hamster. <laughs> but actually, here to tell you all about a series called All About Me. And it was one of the highlights of Going Live, you may remember. And it features, ooh, what? God, all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Advertising the disease of capitalist decadence. I didn't think that was that funny. <laughs> Advertising is the disease of capitalist decadence. Nonsense is the prize, prize I've gone again. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful thing to be. A healthy grown-up, busy, busy bee. Buzzing around every day. Oh, my goodness, I've mucked it up. It's me. <laughs> is teacher feeling strict today? I'll be with you in a few minutes. I'm playing hooky. I've got the telephone around the wrong way. Good evening, and tonight we combine the first day of competition to Moscow Olympic Games with the highlights of the fourth and final day's play in the Open Golf Championship. Gone was the posh flocked wallpaper, the velvet drapes and the carpeting. Here it was all peeling paintwork and pipes and props. He could hear the faint smell. <laughs> <laughs> ah, James Herriot, the very man. May I? 
Yes, of course. Evening, Becca. This is a friend of mine from London. I can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Henderson might drop in to have a cup of tea with his provost. That'd be a happy coincidence, wouldn't it, Brian? Oh, uh, Brian? <laughs> Mr. Thurston is the gentleman I'm dealing with at the moment. What? Mr. Richards is the gentleman... Oh, <laughs> Since then, it's moved on to a much bigger, more prestigious... Prestigious... <laughs> then, it returned to the Opera House which it continued to... Sub <laughs> then it returned to the... <laughs> then... Damn. There we are, fractured pelvis. Not much more I can do. This sort of thing usually heals itself. <laughs> Will you suffer? I can't remember. <laughs> is this, David? With our present installations, we could turn around and service perhaps 50% more aircraft than we do at present. I'm awfully sorry. I was concentrated so hard on my cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Will I give another cue at all? Will I give him 30 seconds? Going. The official unionist, the largest Northern Ireland party, and Enoch Powell, whose majority in South Down was only three and a half thousand last time, also faces a split in the U... <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> so many changes in that wee bit there. The official unionists, which the largest Northern Ireland party, which held seven of the twelve seats at dissolution, is clearly banking on another hung parliament in which it can exert... <laughs> That's reading it. The official unionists, the largest Northern Ireland party, which held seven of the twelve seats at dissolution, is clearly banking on another hung parliament in which you can get killed. No, sorry. Fluff there. It was indeed a golden age of radio comedy with shows like Round the Horn and The Goons. And that golden age is still very much with us. Weekending, the news headlines, and, um... Uh, you know, what's the, you know, uh, the news just, headlines... Uh, just, just, uh, uh, just, oh, just a minute, I know. I know the one, I know it. Um, I'm sorry, I'll read that again. <laughs> Customs men, or revenue men, as they were then called. Let us start again. Customs men, or revenue men, as they were often called in those days. Oh, <laughs> Customs men, or revenue men, as they were called, often had to engage in fierce hand to hand combat to overcome the smuggler. Forcibly overboard. <laughs> Customs men, or revenue men as they were called, often had to engage in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat to overcome the smugglers. Forcibly boarding a boat was the only way in which they could lay their hands on the untaxed brandy coming up the river from France. No, stop it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Customs officers, or revenue men as they were called, often had to engage in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting to overcome the smugglers. Forcibly boarding a boat was the only way they could lay their hands on the untaxed brandy coming up the Thames from France. <laughs> Customs men, or revenue men as they were then called, often had to engage in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat to overpower the smugglers. Forcibly boarding a boat was the only way they could lay their hands on the untaxed brandy coming up the river from France. <laughs> Every presenting nightmare when you want to press life's rewind button to start all over again. What are those occasions when you find yourself saying, what's on your mind, instead of, what's on your script? <laughs> and Sigmund Freud, who noticed that there are times when we know we ought to be saying one thing, but end up saying something entirely different, known as a Freudian slip. And in this celebration of BBC clangers, who can forget that marvellous moment on Test Match Special?
when Brian Johnson announced solemnly, the batsman's holding the bowler's willy. <laughs> most accomplished public speakers sometimes discover that their Freudian slip is showing. Our first clip shows Victor Madden wrapping his tongue around a harmless enough phrase and ending up with something between double dutch and double entendre. It happened in all shows of that pillar of respectable family viewing, Dixon of Doc Green. Now the line the man is trying to deliver is Doc Green Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Doc Green Nick. Simple you say it quickly. Now, Victor went on, by the way, to found a school called Talking Point, dedicated to teaching the art of public speaking and diction. And looking at this next little collection, he'll never be short of pupils. You worry, Evaldean. Where is it? Now, don't just stand there, get! I haven't got it, Mr. Nolan. Now, listen, Weasel, if I don't get that necklace back right now, They'll never be able to put you together again. But I ain't got it. It's down at Doc Green Dick. You worry, Apple Dean. Where is it? Now don't just stand there again. I haven't got it, Mr. Nolan. Now listen, Weasel. If I don't get that necklace right now, they'll never be able to put you together again. But I haven't got it. It's down at Dick Green Dock. There are many who believe that there is far too much politics in local government. I agree. For Liberals and our colleagues in the SDP, getting things done at local level is what really matters. We are fighting the local elections on Thursday on our erection... <laughs> I mean, anything particular about gardening you like? What kind of flowers, for example? I like the actual digging. The real heavy stuff is what I really, really like. And, of course, what I really like as well is a bonfire, but we're not, we're not allowed them these days, are we? But if you were like the, the digging, perhaps you should come round and dig my garden, because that's the bit I absolutely <laughs> you a love. Large one. Well, I garden. think, yes, garden, of course. <laughs> Yes, it's very big. It's surrounded by walls. and there's no walls as well. Monica, what were you actually doing at the time? I was in the bedroom. What were you up to? That's an awful question. <laughs> and while we're casting our eye over the rest of the BBC, we couldn't let those reprobates in the broom cupboard get away scot-free. We've discovered that there's more to Gordon the Gopher and little Ted than meets the eye. It's a doggy dog world behind the crayon facade. Or should I say, doggy gopher? Ah, oh, you've got an ankle biting right. Jack Russell. Zoltan, <laughs> Zoltan does that if you, if you give him half the chance. Biting Gordon's ankles <laughs> right now. He bites your ankles. You find the terriers, they're, they're, they're designed to be nipping dogs, and um, <laughs> you find that they do tend to sort of go after ankles. Other dogs that like it very much are dogs like collies that are taught to nip after sheep and things. Occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> occasionally shits are losing good for the Go for his ankles, Zoltan. Go for his ankles. Don't worry. Don't worry. There's a letter in the store. Hey, Ted, sit down. Oh, now, little Ted's fallen over. My goodness. There's a letter in the story today. Once again on that, please. <laughs> I'm an artist. How am I expected to work with these amateurs? I can't <laughs> By any chance, sir, you've got a Ted like this. I don't think I've got a Ted left. Gordy, get down. Good girl. Then chances are you'll have transformed it into a red Indian Ted like this one. By the way, I know the totem pole, the uh, teepee looks very bulky, but because it's made out of paper, it's actually very easy to fold up and pack away. So if you'd like to have a go, and <laughs> the first thing you want is a Teddy with two legs. <laughs> 
children's programme. Now, I promised you earlier that I would be returning to the BBC News and Current Affairs Department. They're a fine body of men, TV reporters are. Whenever there's danger, whenever the muck and the bullets are flying, skin and hair in all directions, whenever the going gets tough, the courageous men of the BBC Current Affairs Unit know exactly what to do. Send K. Davy. <laughs> the BBC has a long tradition of news journalists who are cool under pressure. Is it the ice in their veins or the ice in their scotch? If there's one thing you can always be sure of, a BBC television reporter can always hold his drink. Unless, of course, that drink happens to be a cup of hot coffee and you're 45 seconds away from the dreaded red light. 45 seconds to the trail, 45. It's a one woman show. Southeast tonight, boroughs unite to get London's traffic moving. Tomorrow. Later, we'll be bringing you up to date on the most wanted and perhaps the most dangerous man in Britain. <laughs> and did the police blunder? I'm sorry, we seem to have lost that film. I was watching it on another monitor up there, but we obviously don't have it here. We'll find out what will um, happen in a moment. I think, I think what we'd better do is to go into the next film, and we'll try and get that film from Rhodesia back. The, um, our next film is about the International Monetary Fund mission, which is coming to Britain. The team of inspectors who are going to scrutinise our accounts before they agree to this gigantic new loan we're trying to raise. We already owe our foreign creditors about $19 billion, so our credit could hardly be called good in any circumstance, and the IMF men start work at a time, of course, when the British Treasury has again shown that its figures can be wrong. With Mr Healy's disclosure, we may have to borrow even more for public spending next year than have been calculated. I'm now interrupted by a telephone, which may mean we've got the film back again. Hello? <laughs> Does that mean you don't have film either of the IMF or of Rhodesia? <laughs> what am I supposed to tell the panorama audience that's watching? I'm sorry about this, this is one of the most... Um, we do occasionally have problems. As you know, those of you who watch Panorama, or have watched it for many years, when we lose film, we occasionally have problems when we lose VT. I've never, in my experience, had a problem when we have lost all our film and all our VT. <laughs> and I'm left sitting here, talking about a film that um, has no commentary on it, so there's nothing I can tell you about it. <laughs> Only a few interviews on it from Rhodesia, and a rather complicated film about the IMF in Washington, the people who are arriving in London, to talk about uh, this loan. We don't even apparently have a standby film <laughs> have about uh, adult literacy. So I suppose we just sit in silence and hope you stick with BBC One while we try and sort this out. <laughs> For those of you who may perhaps just have got home exhausted from the office and turned on the television, you may as well have it between the eyes, and here it is. Sixpence on 20. Uh, plain cigarettes. Whiskey and gin are up four shillings a bottle. Wine is up about a shilling a bottle, and beer is up by one penny a pint. Well, that ends our programme. The news follows at once. That will give you the main points in the budget, which ended just now. And so, until the news in a moment's time, there you are. Hello and goodbye. <laughs> well, finally, my thanks to Hugh Smith of Holt and Kay Colson of Fordham Heath Colchester for sending me these little and large uh, bottles with uh, impossible nails and screws through pieces of wood to further tantalize my brain on how they did it. Oh! Ah. <laughs> they say never go to sea on an empty stomach, so I've had a big breakfast and eaten a lot of oranges, because I gather they taste exactly the same coming up as they do going down. <laughs> I'm not at all worried, it's very calm, beautiful day. Well, the forecast is always wrong. It's a mere 4 7 now, and. Uh, that doesn't seem to have worried most of the crew on board. <laughs>
We're now getting back into uh, to Spithead. I think I've got something in common with Lord Nelson. I'm sorry, excuse me. Over the years, your sport's taken a lot of stick, obviously. They say that you're not really sportsmen at all. You're really just sheer entertainers. You shouldn't really be classed as sportsmen. And to be quite honest, you're really just overweight ballet dancers. Anyone could be... Uh, I'll show you what an overweight ballet dancer can do, shall I? But well, you should be a sportsman. <laughs> Let me speak a bit. Let me speak a bit. Easy, I can't speak. I can't hear me. Loosen it slightly. A bit more. A bit more so they can hear my voice properly. A bit more so they can hear me properly. Just a bit more. So they can hear me properly. So they can hear me. You'll have to give me a tiny bit more so I can speak properly, Scrub. A little bit more so. Let him write off so he can speak. Okay, now. At the very end of it, Scrub, you can do a little bit more pressure, but not an awful lot. <laughs> it's this part of the bridge that the parents are particularly concerned about, the part that leads down a steep slope of an old coal tip, down to the river and the railway bridge, all irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> Nothing that we fans of the Foul Up love more than seeing someone fall over. And we couldn't end this show without a few of those magic moments when the great and the good succumb to the law of gravity. Of course, even the most level-headed amongst us lose our balance sometimes. We all make the odd slip, lose our dignity. But there are times when you have to conclude that the demon drink is implicated. And I can say here and now, without fear of an expensive lawsuit, at the star of this first clip, is rotten, maggoty, mouldy, drunk. <laughs> As for the others, I'll let you work out that for yourselves. I'll put him down for some more. Can you see the mouth? Yes, I can. Lapping, look at the mouth. It's the first drunk we've ever had on Nationwide. Thank you very much for introducing us to him. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Mother, but you didn't go through the gate, you went through the fence. They like some turnip, do they? Oh, 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 she lost the lamb, look. Don't you dip He's always unstable, even as a small child. Socially, it would be Dame, whatever her Christian name is. Yes. Uh, on the bench, it would uh, be Your Ladyship or My Lady or so. I'd love to apologise. Uh, actually, to our actors, who've been standing here for a very long time under the lights, do just stay there. Uh, I should go past our poor judge. They have been very patient standing on these hot lights for a very long time. We yes. should have provided chairs, we didn't. Outside the living room of Mr. Hammersteen's house at 10 East 63rd Street, New York. Inside at the piano, Mr. Richard Rogers. Behind him, Mr. Oscar Hammerstein. The tune, Oklahoma. Let's go and see them, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> OK, sit back, everyone. Now, I mastered this. Did you? Oh, yes. <laughs> No problem. Thank you. What we need is some more horsepower, which brings me nicely onto the subject of a young lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wayne, there's someone outside for you. Says you dance together in Swan Lake. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> you search through the archives, you find all kinds of stuff that engineers and editors and backroom boys have hidden away for posterity. And I'd like to thank them for saving these treasures for the nation. And our thanks also go to all the performers who so generously allowed us to show the real lowlights of their careers. From me and all the other lovers of sweepings from the BBC's cutting room floor, good night.